Sup y'all, and welcome to Population Geography Part 5. Let's take a look at the population explosion by quickly investigating this map showing population growth rates around the world. So investigating some of these numbers, we can look at a country like China, which has a growth rate of 0.5% in large part due to restrictive population policies we will talk about later. Or look at Russia with a 0.2% decline in population due to low growth rates, but also due to emigration out of the country. And we can see Germany also at a 0.2% decline, but mostly due to its standard of living and declining birth rates, especially among young women who are choosing to have careers and hold off raising families until later in life. Or we can look at countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, such as Kenya, with a 2.7% growth rate. We can see the United States has a 0.6% growth rate. And even looking at newly industrialized countries like Brazil with a 1% growth rate. But let's dig into the numbers even deeper. China and the United States have nearly identical growth rates. However, take a look at what this really means. At this pace, China will increase its population by more than 6 million every single year whereas the United States with a smaller population will increase by less than 2 million. Before we get into more population policies, we're first going to look at the epidemiological transition model, first developed by Abdel Omran back in 1971, which is related to the demographic transition model. And this occurs as a country undergoes the process of modernization from developing nation to developed nation status. Now at stage one, you have the age of pestilence and famine where mortality is high and fluctuating, precluding sustained population growth with low and variable life expectancy. Then, what you would hit is stage 2, or the age of receding pandemics, where mortality progressively declines, with the rate of decline accelerating as epidemic peaks decrease in frequency. At this stage, average life expectancy increases steadily, and population growth is sustained and begins to become exponential. And then you get to stage three as a society develops even further, the age of degenerative and man-made diseases. Here, mortality continues to decline and eventually approaches stability at a relatively low level. Ultimately, this predicts the same thing as the demographic transition model, it just does it from a different angle. Even though growth rates have declined worldwide, we still see images like this. Or images like this. And even images like this. Now, I could go on like this all day, but the fact remains that population growth and population concentrations are not even around the world. So, governments have established population policies for their respective needs. Now, expansive population policies are used where they want to increase the growth rates. Or restrictive population policies have been enacted where they've tried to reduce growth rates. And even though eugenics have been used largely to a negative degree... Nation states such as Japan have sought to preserve their ways and their cultural identity, and therefore have restricted immigration. So, first off, eugenic population policies are designed to favor one racial, ethnic, or cultural sector over others. The Nazis in Germany were a clear extreme example of eugenic policies. Favoring the German people, especially of the Aryan appearance, they deemed all other races to be inferior seeking to eliminate them and ultimately resulting in the Holocaust. They also sought to eliminate those with disabilities, as you can see in this poster produced by their euthanasia program running from 1939 to 1941. Other eugenic policies may have been less extreme, but were still unjust, such as the Jim Crow laws in the United States up until the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. Some state governments in the South set up separate facilities and utilities for African Americans enacting policies associated with eugenics. Next, restrictive policies are designed to slow or restrict population growth through birth control, family planning, or even outright prohibition beyond a certain number. As was the case with China's one-child policy, introduced after Mao Zedong had passed away between 1978 to 1980 and formally ending in 2015. Internal governments imposed fines, prison sentences, and according to some reports, even carried out forced abortions. However, there were a myriad of exceptions. For instance, this policy applied only to the ethnically dominant Han Chinese, who make up over 90% of China's total population, so minorities were exempt. Furthermore, people working in agricultural sectors were also sometimes exempt, and more than half were allowed to have a second child if the first was a girl. 
Nonetheless, this policy led to an inordinate number of female orphans, since many parents did not qualify for any exemptions, and this led to a tremendous imbalance of males to females. In 2015, the gender ratio at birth was 116 boys born to every 100 girls. The success of this program has been disputed. China's fertility rate has declined as a result, but as their population is aging, this huge cohort of people will be nearing retirement age in less than two decades. To provide more of a future workforce to support the rising number of elderly, China has amended this to a two-child policy since the start of 2016. Other countries also have restricted policies, such as India, which is projected to surpass China as the largest population in the world by mid-21st century. In the 1960s, India started a family planning program and expanded this in the 1970s, forcing many men with three or more children to have vasectomies. However, being that India is the largest democracy in the world, and people don't generally like their governments telling them what to do, this policy soon ended. Today, most states within India utilize advertising and other incentives to lower growth rates, especially in the north where birth rates are highest. Here you can see a free family planning sterilization clinic, which was actually closed in 1996. Too bad, since they were also a great place to pick up some quality garden umbrellas and hammocks. If we're going to talk about expansive population policies, we will be remiss not to mention the Soviet Union, especially in the years following World War II. Now, since the Soviet Union was born out of communism, it followed very closely to the philosophies of Karl Marx, the author of such books like The Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. Now, Marx believed that capitalism was the source of all the world's problems, that it created an unequal distribution of wealth, and that there was enough food for everyone, if only the haves would share with the have-nots. Marx stated that socialism would promote the equal distribution of wealth, and food for that matter. Now, couple those beliefs with the reality of post-World War II Soviet Union. As you can see on the chart, they lost more than 14% of their population throughout the tragic war. So you can see up here, you can see the 25 million they started with, and over 14% died. Now that accounts for more than 3.5 million deaths throughout World War II. So, Stalin and other communist officials set out to massively expand their population and the power of the Soviet Union overall, through armed strength and industrialization. Now you need a lot of people to make that happen. They even awarded medals and titles to women for bearing and raising large families. The most prestigious title was that of Mother Heroine, now that's heroin with an E at the end, thank you very much. How many children, you ask? Let me refer to a colleague of mine, LeBron James. So, if a Soviet woman was to receive the title of mother heroin, how many live babies would she need to give birth to? Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. Oh. Thank you, LeBron. While technically true, let me just ask someone else. Mr. Rooney from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. If a Soviet woman was to receive the title of mother heroine, how many times would she need to give birth? Nine times. All right, let's just cut to the chase. The answer is 10. That's right, 10 children. So to recap, if a woman, make that a Soviet woman, was to give birth to 10 living babies and they all survived their first year, then she would get this. Thank you very much. And now for something completely different. <laughs>